Good evening. Welcome to the City of Montpelier Development Review Board for Monday, August 20th, 2018. My name is Daniel Richardson. I am the chair and the other members of the board from my right are Rob Goodwin, Kevin O'Connell, Meredith Crandall, staff, Kate McCarthy, Tom Kester, Claire Rock. All right. Uh, the first order of business is approval of the agenda. Do I have either a motion to approve the agenda or a motion to amend? So moved. Motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Tom. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of the agenda as printed, please raise your right hand. We have an agenda. All right. There are no comments from the chair. I will discuss. This is a somewhat unique um, application before us, um, and some of the members on the board now are new to this, uh, so we'll have a discussion at that point. The next item is approval of the minutes of August 6th. Myself, Kevin, Kate, uh, Tom, and Rob were in attendance. Um, I would make two suggested edits to this. Um, one is, uh, I believe that in my comments from the chair, I also welcomed the new members to the board, which would have been Rob, Deb, and um, Tom at the time. Okay, so do you want to name them? Yes. Just okay. add them okay, yeah, it's as a welcome. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I voted for myself as chair, but um, <laughs> if I had, I would have voted for myself. But. <laughs> I think it was another 6-0 vote yes, with me abstaining. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, but other than those changes, any other changes or a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Motion by Kevin, as amended, right? As amended. Thank you. Uh, motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? A second. Second by Rob. All those in favor of the minutes that are eligible to vote for them, please raise your right hand. We have minutes. And welcome to Ryan. All right, we have only one piece of business before us tonight, and that is the Murray Hill uh, final plan review for the one lot subdivision. And uh, I'll just simply note for those who have, were not here at the last meeting, a couple of key points that we decided or that were decided as a result uh, of the application. First of all, uh, this is an amendment to a 1983 subdivision. So a lot of the substantive rules that we're going to be applying tonight go back to the 1983, or actually 1973, uh, zoning and subdivision regulations. And so um, if you have any questions, I know that the packet itself and the memo had a lot of that, but we'll refer to Meredith, uh, as well as taking testimony from some of the original developers who are here tonight. Uh, the other point is that at our last meeting, there was a vote taken uh, not to apply the uh, Stoke Club Highlands test and analysis for this application. Uh, it was determined by the board at that initial meeting based on the testimony that this was not uh, a condition of the, the, having the lot as common area was not a condition of the original approval. Therefore, we're really uh, looking at this as a subdivision amendment. I think that's a really important distinction to make because we're not looking to meet the Stoke Club Highland criteria, which is a fairly high threshold, although there was testimony that they may have been able to make it. But for tonight, we just simply are looking at the application as it stands. Any questions as a preliminary matter? Um, if not, I'll invite the applicant to come forward. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Please. May I ask a clarification on Stoke Club Highlands? It has to do, we've made our decision about it, so right. I'm not asking that we change that, but it has to do with the con condition not being an essential condition, right? So we can still acknowledge that it may have been a condition at the time of approval, mm -hmm. but it was deemed not so, so integral to the operation, uh, the, the building of the PU planned unit development. Um, I just want to make that distinction in case anyone in the audience was confused that it was not a condition at all. It was a condition, but it was deemed not a difficult word, but 
um, under Stowe. It's it's a little bit of a gray area. Okay. I mean, um, I don't mean to add confusion. That's okay. Um, it's it, it. it was a condition um, in the sense that the applicant asked for it to be put on, um, but it wasn't a condition in the sense that the it was determined that it, the. Uh, permit was not conditioned upon its issuance, which Thank may you. be the okay. important distinction to be made here okay. um, that the board found last time. Great. Thank you. I wanted to get that nuance out there as to what it is and what it isn't that we're working with. Thank you. Sorry. So here we are again. Um, for those of you who weren't here last meeting, my name is Eric Bigglestone. I'm the president of Murray Hills Homers Association. Um, we have asked Ken and Joan Senecal here to represent us in our organization. While they are the original developers of Murray Hill, um, it is not their personal interest tonight um, to get the permits that we're asking for. They are acting on behalf of Murray Hill Homeowners Association because um, they have a great amount of knowledge. Um, and we ask them as a board to represent us today. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. If you'll uh, state your names for the record, please, and then I'm going to swear people in. Okay. Uh, Ken Senecal. Joan Senecal. You may want to move that microphone. I just okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, So I'll ask, I'll ask you, and I'll ask anyone who's considering giving testimony at this time uh, on this matter, whether it's in the form of testimony and support or comments um, uh, that you wish the board to consider uh, beyond the scope of the uh, application. If you'll raise your right hand, just to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence or testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury? I do. I do. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Um, so, Meredith, I tried to give a sort of overall procedural background for the board, but if you could dive in a little bit more and give us a little bit greater detail and focus us particularly on the issues that we have before us tonight. Will do. You actually took away a whole bunch of my preliminary stuff, so that's great. Um, so, for especially for members who weren't here last time, um, this is the final plan review for this um, removal of a condition from the plan unit development plat, as well as a boundary line adjustment. Um, because the PUDs and the subdivisions both have to go through subdivision process. There was a sketch plan review earlier, so this is the final plan review. You can actually make a determination on the entire application tonight. Um, so this application is for two things. One, that the condition reserved for common land no longer be included on the Murray Hill Lot 1 plat for the PUD. Um, and that's something that administratively I cannot do on my own. It's a decision that the board has to make. The second item is a boundary line adjustment to make this lot one larger so it can be developed um, for a single family home. And normally that would be something that the um, administrative officer can do without board approval, but there are conditions on here be reserved for common land, um, as well as determining if any other permit conditions um, are going to be violated by that boundary line adjustment that I can't make. So those are, they're, it's a multi-step process. Um, so uh, one point to note is to see the final outcome in the big picture and what they're hoping to do with lot one. About halfway through your packet is the site plan. That's a good reference point. You're going to be referencing that multiple times throughout this hearing. Um, for reserving, removing the reserve for common land designation, um, this requires review under the zoning regulations from 1973. And the key item, based on my analysis of those regulations, the key item is that the board is going to need to decide um, whether the density and open spaces allotment and how everything is worked out 
um, whether to, to do that, you're going to have to consider the choice and types of environment or living units available to pu the public and several different items. The key ones that I think you're going to need to focus on are open space or recreation areas, um, the pattern of development that preserves trees, outstanding natural topography and geologic features, and um, an environment in harmony with surrounding development. This analysis is on page just six through nine of your staff report. And given comments from sketch plan review, I think that's where we're going to have the most, or the most likely to have public comments and people wanting to focus on those areas. Um, the second item, once you've resolved this first reserve for common land issue, the second item is the boundary line adjustment. Um, and n the, the key items there are, um, the, the only way you can do the boundary line adjustment is to, um, for the board to confirm approval of the removal of that plat condition, as well as confirming my analysis, which is in the memo at the end of the packet, um, that the planned unit development is allowed another dwelling unit. <clears throat> Those are the big items that you're going to need to focus on. Um, there were some wastewater and stormwater issues that were brought up during sketch plan review. I think those items have been addressed by the updated application. Um, and if you need references to where in the staff report that's discussed, ask me when we get there. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So the floor is yours if you want to bring us up to date and focus us on some of these issues. All right. Um, I'm Ken Senecal. And Went through this uh, last time, but I thought with new members I'll do a very quick uh, pass through of the history of uh, Lot 1. This plan that I'm showing you now, you have it in your packet, uh, is the original master plan for uh, the first 75 units at Murray Hill. Lot 1 was included. Um, lot one uh, at uh, conditional use, which is with, in those days was the second stage of the permit process, was approved, received conditional approval. When we went in for um, final approval, we only applied for 48 units. Thank you. Um, we only applied for 48 units and we showed the other area. Um, lot one, as originally configured, disappeared. And instead, the entire area, which is now made up of lot one and common land, was designated as reserve lot number one. Um, so that's the second stage. And this plan was approved in uh, October of 1983. Uh, and we received our zoning permit and proceeded with uh, development on that. Excuse me, that was 1983. Did I say 84? No. Oh, good. Okay. Um, okay. And then the third incarnation of Lot 1 appears on a plan that was uh, the subject of the City Planning Commission holding a hearing to determine whether the development had been built according to the plans and permits that, had, uh, that were in place. And lot one is shown on that plan in a new shape. It's no longer uh, common land plus lot one. It is lot one in a triangular shape. Um, about a quarter of an acre in size. So th that's the um, status of 
lot one as we stand here this evening is it's a triangular lot of roughly a quarter of an acre in size. We're asking that it be um, boundary be adjusted so that it will look like this. Uh, this is a new plan. Um, I don't know if you have in your packets a, um, a plan that labels lot one blow up. Yep. Not as in bang bang, but just <laughs> bigger. Uh, if you follow along with that, I this plan. I've got some colors on it so that it'll be easier to see from where you're sitting. But this uh, plan will track with this smaller version that you have. If you don't have it, I have extra copies here for you. So if anyone is unable to find lot one blow up, just wave your hand. Looks like you all have it. I'm going to get those to people here. Okay. So, I'll, I'll run through this very quickly. Um, I don't know uh, with new members um, whether I'm shortchanging you, but I'm sure you'll tell me. Um, so this uh, is a blow up of that small plan, and I've added uh, some colors in. The blue line represents the new configuration of lot one. A dotted line across here in black divides the triangular lot which currently exists from the land that we're adding to uh, lot number one. Within the blue area, there is a yellow area that has a label on it that says building envelope. This is the area on the lot where structures can be placed. They can be placed no, no other location. You can have a driveway, but structures have to be within uh, the way where the association is going to sell the land. The structures have to be within that building envelope. Um, on the plan, there is the, an outline of a building. I do not expect that building to look like that when a zoning, uh, a building permit is sought from the city. I expect the buyer will design their own house. They'll be limited to building within the yellow area. Um, and I think that's what I want to say on that. I have uh, highlighted, because there were two um, issues brought up by uh, Don Varney, who is the adjoining property. Owner, he lives here next to lot one. One was he mentioned that he has a driveway easement across the part of lot one. And I wanted you to be able to put that in context. It's a 25 foot easement to the east, a 25 foot easement to the south, and a line connecting them together. So the driveway easement that he was referring to is here, and the building is here. So there's no interaction between where we want to build and where he has a driveway easement. Um, some of that water, please. Yeah. Um, the other issue, well, I'm not sure he brought it up, but actually something else brought it up. 
it was the uh, drainage system. I guess Tom McCardle, the director of Public Works, wanted clarification. He had given us three options on how to handle an existing um, stormwater uh, swale uh, and a city culvert that goes under Murray Hill Drive. And he said we could either take the stormwater down all the way to Main Street and then go into the existing culvert down there. We could bring, leave the culvert under, and that would mean eliminating the culvert under Murray Hill Drive that feeds the water into the drainage soil. Or he said you could come across Murray Hill Drive and take the water down this side of Murray Hill Drive and then into the Main Street ditch. Or you could just leave it alone. From my point of view, uh, the existence of the drainage swale is a real asset to Lot 1. The constructed area on the Don Barney lot is uphill. Now, the grades are pretty gentle here, but still it's uphill from where a house would be located on Lot 1. This drainage swale will intercept all of the surface water that moves towards that building area. So the water that, if the drainage swale weren't there, would head this way, and whatever's built here would have to make provision for diverting that water. Or we could leave the drainage swale here and let any water moving from the paving and the roofs on the Barney property simply flows into this swale, heads down this way, and goes south of the location where the house would be built. And Ken, not to interrupt you, but um, that swale is, as, that exists today, that drainage it swale? It was yeah. built in 1984. Uh, it's functioned uh, to perfection. The, the road comes down one side of Murray Hill Drive, goes through a culvert under Murray Hill Drive, and then it enters, this is a fairly flat, the reason I call it a swale is because I distinguish between a swale and a ditch, is a swale is something that is made for the purpose of uh, causing water to spread out instead of running in a tight, constricted channel where it can have more erosive power and will move faster. So this is built intentionally on a much gentler grade than if the water were just running down the slope. Uh, and it's uh, the bottom of this swale is five feet wide and then the top edge it's about uh, 30 inches deep total from bank to bank and uh, it's about uh, 12 feet wide at the top of the bank. So it, it's a really neat way of picking up the water, diverting it, and then outletting it uh, into the open meadow land uh, where it was originally intended to go. So I don't know if that's the background I wanted to give. If there's anything more I'd be glad to answer your questions. I'm sure we'll have a couple of questions. I bet you will. Take <laughs> stormwater reception. So, yeah. Meredith, um, I just wanted to, I think it, it may be helpful to start at the density. Um, and you've included the memorandum in our packet from August 9th, 1983, that Michael Jones, your predecessor by several, um, <laughs> included as far as the density is concerned. If you could just walk us through that calculation. Um, okay. And this is, this is under the old PUD as far as the, their density allowed, and in part because of the differences in how it was built out, but also in part how the uh, PUD has acquired land over the past three years. Correct. Um, 
So, the initial analysis by Michael Jones, um, which is the second attachment to this, the um, memo on the density, was based on the PUD's original size, um, which was, I have it, sorry, I have to jump around a little bit. Um, Sorry, it's the, the February 7th, 1983. Yeah, February 7th, 1983. Right, but it, okay. that, that they didn't put the full amount there, did they? I have it in my memo, but I can't find it right now. <laughs> it's got 85 units on the back. Yeah, it has 80. Right, I'm looking for the actual acreage. Sorry, 57 plus acres. And they allowed a total of 85 units because the area of the Murray Hill PUD at that point was a mix of low density and medium density allowances, um, but so the, the total, under the low density, you could have um, a total of 48 units, and under medium density, you could have, oh, sorry, 24, yeah, 48 units and then 37 for multifamily under medium density. Um, but, but ultimately, where those units were located on those 57 acres was up to the board and the planners. They could put them anywhere mm -hmm. as long as they considered certain criteria. Now, at this point, the Murray Hill PUD is now 70.7 .7 acres. They've added you know, several acres to the total, over 13. Um, and under my analysis, it doesn't really make sense to say you've added all this acreage, you still can only have 85 units. Um, now, exactly how many units they would be allowed under the old regulations, I, I haven't gone through to look all of that up. At this point, they're only asking to add one unit. Mm -hmm. And how many? They should be allowed to have it. You know, it. It seems like under those old density requirements, if they've added 13 acres, adding one more unit to the total doesn't, it, it, it well, seems to make sense when they've only built 85 housing units is total it, with that added acreage. Is it 85 or 81? It, it's 85. 81 okay. are connected to the water system. That may be where you heard that number. Okay. Well, they, they have... 85 is the total number of units. Right, okay. so they have 85 units total in the entire planned unit development. Mm -hmm. And here I have a reference to 81. That's in the areas 1 and 2. Right. The area 3 that was added in um, that you can see in the maps... D and E at the back of that memorandum. That new area has only three single family condominium units in it and one single family home. Right. So for purposes of the calculation as to how many new dwelling units they can put in this area one that they're working on, mm -hmm. it looks like they have 81 in there. That was trying, trying to focus our analysis <clears throat> as close as we can to the original 57 acres. Right. So, to, sorry, to restate, area one is the 57 acres of the original application. Yes. And area one in the original application was allowed 85, 85 units, units, but built 81. The additional four units are in area well, three? Well, they've, they've, they adjusted where area two was. Oh, yeah. phooey. They've adjusted, okay. there's 81 units in one and two. One and two. I see. So some of this land in yellow mm -hmm. was originally part of area one, but things got rearranged based on the conditions that you found on the sites. Mm -hmm. And so trying to parse out what in here was area one, what was area two, it was hard to come up with. I so but I, areas one and two have 81 units. Y your general analysis is that one more unit isn't going to impinge upon the PUD density. Correct. Um, even if we go back to the 1973 numbers. 
even the 1973 numbers, it's not going to impinge on that density so requirement. So I don't know if anyone all. had any questions about that. I, I actually have a visual that may help because it shows exactly what Meredith just went through. Um, so the original, well, I need to get the right board up here. <laughs> And that's where the 81 units are today. And that is, yes. Uh, pre pretty much. Mostly. Yeah, mostly, yes. Mostly. Uh, with, well, with a couple of adjustments. Yeah, I'll show you very, very quickly the adjustment. So this was the tract of land, 57 acres, and the city ruled that we could put 85 units on the 57 acres. Over the years, we have added 13.7 acres and what we call area three. So this is the new acreage that's been added to the 57. And you'll see that, you, well actually you probably can't see it from that. But area three is shown here with a single family house and three single family condominium buildings. That's four of them. But then the, the uh, uncertainty about how many are on the original land is oh, in this area right. because we actually built uh, four buildings with a total of at least five units in them right. on the 13.7 acres that we added. And so, I, uh, so we ended up with significantly less units on the original 57 acres than was originally approved. Right. And I think we testified at the last meeting that we added some of that land so we could spread those last condominiums out further right. and they wouldn't be jammed up. Right. And, and and I think I just wanted to maybe start with this because I felt it was an easy question that we're below the density level. And I think the testimony is fairly clear on that. And I'm only speaking for myself, but I'm seeing nods of agreement that mm -hmm. having one more unit isn't going to be offensive to the original density limits or uh, the calculations that were done given the additional land and no matter which way we sort of shake out mm -hmm. the allocation of these units, whether they be for uh, area one, two, or three, mm -hmm. we seem to be below that threshold. So so I think that's 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 an important place to start. And it, it what we're really talking about then is um, the condition um, that this be common land. And, and what I'd like to hear um, is a little bit of the description of th the remaining common land um, that's being held by the uh, association. Okay, so the common land at Murray Hill consists of uh, roughly 12 and a half acres of meadow land. Uh, it's all open land, uh, only a few trees that were planted uh, along the side of the road. Uh, the land is also where the drilled wells that supply the Murray Hill water uh, are located. So this land, as far as the state uh, water supply regulations, is off limit for any future development because it's within what's called the wellhead protection area for the wells. So 12, this is a 12 and a half acre parcel. Um, let's put up the, uh, there are four acres roughly of common land right now plus lot one. 
Um, if lot one, if you approve the boundary adjustment, then the total acreage will be just under four acres, 3.9 something or other. Um, so 12 and a half here, uh, 3.9 here of all open land. And then there's uh, 1.6 acres of common land. Uh, quite a bit of it is open land, but it also contains the swimming pool, uh, a pool house, and uh, two tennis courts. Uh, it's also uh, encroachment, a legal one, by the area one garages that also uh, protrude into that area. Um, so there's a total after, uh, if you approve the boundary adjustment, you will have a total of uh, about 17.95 acres of common land. And right now there is a total, if you include lot one, which is common land, it's, it's owned in common. Um, there is a total of 18.5 roughly, and it would be reduced to 17.95 with the boundary adjustment. Um, out of curiosity, I looked at your new zoning ordinance to try to determine, because that does have uh, uh, square footage requirements of common land. Uh, in a PUD, and uh, I, I used the number at the sketch plan hearing that I, I think is accurate, but it just sounds like an exaggeration. But uh, I think the, the requirement is that there's 400 square feet of open land to be set aside permanently in the new ordinance for each unit. And when I applied that to the common land we have here, that mean, meant that if you could build solely based on the amount of common land you had to have, you could build something like 1,500 units on the Murray Hill property. And, and the point of saying this isn't to make it sound like we have a whole lot of Land, but it's to demonstrate that uh, even under your new ordinance, this development has far more common land than would have been required or if we were under the new ordinance. The old ordinance that we're under for this part of your review uh, had no standard for the amount of common land. I guess I have a question, which is uh, how much common land was added to the overall development in the additional land acquisitions for the expanded uh, phase two, area two and area three? Is there other common land in, in that 13 acres? Uh, no, there, there's not owned in by all of the owners. There is common land within each of the three condominium areas, but it's limited to, it's owned by the people in the individual condominium uh, area. So we did not add land. What we did was this common land, the uh, 18.5 acres of common land, including lot one, was determined to be adequate for putting aside standards. It was, it was found by the Planning Commission to be adequate for the 85 units that we were proposing to put on 57 acres. But we didn't put 85 units on 57 acres. We put 85 units on 
71 acres, roughly. So, and, and of those units, um, at least at least four, without getting into whether how many of these condominium units that would have been built on the 57 acres, which we actually built on the 13 that we added, just putting that aside, we're looking only at new units that were added exclusively outside of the original 57 acres. Uh, four of the lead five units are, are those new units on new land. So you do not have the same, if you divide that out, you do not have the, any reduction, in fact, you have more common land for the units that were originally approved. So I'd like to build on Ryan's question, um, which is a question that I appreciate. Um, so it sounds like based on where there is currently common land owned by the whole homeowners association, not just one condo group or another condo group, um, it sounds like there is no common land up in area three where we could be having this conversation again in 20 years. Right. So the land that's up there that's owned in common by the com condo owners has more to do with driveways or garages or yeah. gold ball courts, mm -hmm. thing, those kinds of things. OK. Thank you. So I want to draw um, your attention to the existing features of Lot 1. How would you characterize the the features of lot one is it heavily wooded is it open meadow um, what's the elevation where does it sit from you know if you're driving up main street will you be able to see this development from main street or will you only be able to see it once you turn on to murray hill drive um let's start with the the lay of the land so this land has um somewhere be between varies from six to to uh, nine percent slopes, or I've used eight and I've used ten, but it's it's about uh, six to nine percent slope uh, in the area where lot one is located. It's all there's one tree on it, a planted oak, a uh, a gorgeous tree that um, it's now. 35 years old and it should live to be a couple hundred at least and more. Um, so it's open land, uh, just one planted tree on it. Um, the We talked about the uh, drainage uh, on the land, uh, that feature of it. Um, the maximum square footage of structures on that lot under your ordinance is 2,500 square feet. Uh, the state uh, water, uh, stormwater division has exempted us, uh, this development, from review of uh, up to 5,000 square feet. So we'll be building on We'll have a driveway, so uh, I'm not sure what the total will be, but it'll be well under the 5,000 square feet that the state uh, exempted. Uh, I think there was another point you had that I didn't respond That's okay. To. I'll, I'll add. I sort of threw a bunch out at you, um, but I'm curious as far as what your testimony is as to the view that will be seen of this house from uh, Main yes. Street. Yeah, as, as you um, approach the turn into Murray Hill Drive, going north on uh, Upper Main Street or the County Road, whichever you uh, think of the name for it, um, you will see this house. If you look to your left as you're driving north, uh, you can see uh, five or six of the existing homes, um, probably just five on your left. 
Uh, if you're driving south, you can probably see seven houses uh, from Main Street. Uh, this will be closer to Main Street than any of the other houses, so it will be uh, somewhat more noticeable from uh, Main Street. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's located as part of um, a small neighborhood, which will be eight houses. And this, uh, when I think you've seen the aerial photos that we've included, uh, it's a very uh, logical uh, fit with the homes that are in the neighborhood. So I think the impression visually as you go north or south is going to be that you're looking at a small cluster of houses in uh, the background of open meadowland. Okay. And will this um, impede anybody's view of the meadow, of the, the large circular 12-acre meadow? Uh, I think the um, we've gone around and talked to each of the neighbors who can see the uh, property and who can see where lot one it would be. And uh, the only property owner who has expressed any concern about that spoke at the last meeting. Um, that's uh, Mr. Hahn. And I have a um, handout. I gave him a copy before the hearing. I don't know if you want me handing out exhibits now or do you want me to wait? That's fine. Uh, you can have, um, yeah, you can certainly hand out and. Okay. If it is, um, illustrates your point. I can do this. Just. I sprained my knee, so he's trying to say, don't keep trying to get up. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. Sure. Um, I, I think it would have been helpful to see topo lines on one of these maps to get a better understanding of the lay of the land. Um, we have. And, and I was kind of curious about the regulations that we're we'll applying to this because I was wondering if there was a setback requirement from Upper Main Street um, uh, as far as you know, what building could be set back or if there was any indication of a requirement of a view shed. Because um, I think, as you had mentioned, you will see it from Main Street, and it will yep. be a mm -hmm. more prominent building in the view as you're coming up Main Street. So I wasn't sure if the past regulations included any setback requirements from Upper Main Street. Uh, no, there, there is no setback requirement. There, there's an important point, though, that I'd like to go back to, and that is that the plan for there to be a house on lot one was in the original plan that the city approved. So lot one was shown, uh, the, the, the variation we're doing is slightly more closer. You, you have this in your mm -hmm. packet, I believe, the so-called boil plan. So the Planning Commission at the time took into consideration the impacts of a house being on a lot one. Um, it was only uh, Joan, I should blame it all on her, but it was our foolishness in deciding we did not want to build on lot one. We wanted to give it to the association and let the association be the one that made the decision at some, whatever point in time it chose, whether it would actually build something on lot one. And that's what we did. The, the association got lot one as a gift. But lot one was reviewed and was, its impact was considered in the original approvals for Murray Hill. And it's on the as-built plan. Right, and it's also on the as-built plan. But I just wanted to make make that point that, you know, it isn't that this is the first time 
I've stood here and said we're going to build a house on lot one. I said that in 1983. And it was only later that we decided to give that lot to the association and not build on it ourselves. Go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, with the setbacks, it, it's a little confusing as to what's the old regulations, what's the new regulations. For the actual setbacks, this is all under the new regulations. It's like their water setbacks have to meet the new regulations. Um, because otherwise, you know, just about anybody could be grandfathered for a zillion things. So the setbacks have to meet the new ones. I think and the setbacks, the, the 20 yard side yard setback would be what's applicable to the yeah, property line. Exactly. Right, from Murray from Murray Hill Road, we're looking at that as the front setback. Right, that's so the, the front setback. That's the front yard. Is irrelevant. Right, right. because it'd be, it would be just, just at, in the subdivision, line. it would be cut off. Yeah. Uh, you may also want to look at the uh, lot one because yeah. it has some to topo lines on there. Yep. It's also on the site plan. There's some topo the lines, lines on, on the site plan as well. Yeah. So while we're on the topic of setbacks, yeah. may I? Um, and we have the. Um, this diagram up and you um, sh you told us that the yellow area is the building envelope um, and I just wanted to I was looking at the numbers on the diagram we have and comparing them to the actual setbacks um, the front yard setback on that is 40 feet only 20 feet is required the side yard setback on that is 20 feet only 15 is required and I think the rear is 30 the reason I point that out is that technically, in, unless there's a different set of setbacks in the homeowners association, technically someone who bought this lot would be able to build in slightly more area than is currently colored in yellow. So as we're reviewing, it's only five feet this side, five feet this side, but it's 20 feet here. Um, that will give us an idea of the pieces of the lot that could be eligible to be constructed on. Okay. And, and I would ask the uh, board to make it a condition of the approval that the setbacks we've shown on this plan be adhered to. Um, that's the, the intent is that the association is going to sell this land subject to construction structures being located within that building envelope area. Mm -hmm. We do not want um, uh, the home to be closer to any of the property lines than would be allowed by the building envelope. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making us aware of that request. Um, I would be interested in knowing from the chair and our zoning administrator whether that is something we have the power to do or whether that would be incumbent upon the homeowners association to implement its own restrictions based on its goals. Or if that's our role to implement your goals. We can we can always we can always approve if the, if the applicant asks for a more restrictive condition such as this. We can always approve it. Um, <laughs> that's what I, I'm, I'm curious. If is agree. there is this is this to keep the uniformity of development? It is. Okay. It, it's to uh, when, when I look at uh, Murray Hill and drive through or I'm on Main Street. Um, the fact that the uh, buildings are clustered, but there's always in they're in the presence of uh, significant amounts of open land. Uh, if we allow under the uh, is it 15 feet in the newest ordinance? 15 or foot setbacks. 15 setback. foot side setbacks and 20 I feet for the front. Um, I um, I would hope that. Uh, that would not be allowed in this development. I think that I know the, the goals, uh, some of the goals that were considered in creating your new ordinance were uh, to allow infill development and to allow some more compact design. Um, I would not want to see uh, a development that I think uh, works really well visually uh, to be affected by having um, structures on adjoining lots being only um, 30 feet apart. So it'd be 15 feet set back mm -hmm. on each side. Uh, when we did the design for 
this section where the eight, the um, lot one and its neighboring eight, seven units are located, uh, we really wrestled with how we would uh, make it feel as you drove through there that you were seeing lots of greenery and, and open space in the buildings. And so our reliance was on 20-foot setbacks minimum for a side yard. Uh, so that meant 40 feet space between structures on adjoining lots. And uh, I would, I think it would be a shame if, if that were reduced. Okay. Oh, how about distance from the road from other existing houses, even within there? It looks like some of these, um, including the lot, the next lot up, the structure might be closer than mm -hmm. 40 feet to the road. And it seems like, you know, if they wanted to have a, if the homeowner wanted a shorter driveway and to actually move the house further out of uh, what's now that field. That wouldn't be a bad thing to me. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that 40-yard front front yard setback? You mean half? When the regulations right now yeah, only re require the 20. regulations right now only require a 20-foot setback in the front. It's drawn as 40 on the plans. Yeah. Um, and I, well, there are a couple of things about that. The PUD permit adopted the medium density setback requirement. Mm -hmm. So we're operating under its 20 foot side yard setbacks, its 30 foot front and back setbacks. Um, so, and our view of that is that that's locked in stone or concrete as far as uh, because every property owner who bought in has the right to enforce the um, standards that uh, were, in, were current at the time they purchased the property. So I'm, I'm wondering if someone wanted to put a shed 15 feet from their property line, if it would now be allowed under the new zoning, or if they would be stuck with the old. I think it would be allowed under the new zoning. A accessory structures, but that's only in the side yards. Sheds can't go in the front. So okay. So the, it's now it's now 15 yards, or f sorry, 15 feet. Um, if, uh, I don't remember. Ex I mean, this the I don't remember exactly what. The allowance is for here, but yes, I guess you, my, can, you yeah. can bump into that for accessory structures. I guess my point is that even if these were approved as lots with 20-foot side setbacks, they now all exist in the new under the new zoning regime, and so could conceivably put their accessory structures or have their building envelope with 15-foot side yard setbacks. Mm -hmm. Right, if unless we yes. condition the approval of the lot to. I mean the existing lots, not this one. Correct. Right. Existing well, existing but, but ones I could come to us as long as it's I not a violation of the PUD rules. Right. Exactly. Right. Or, it's, or if they're if they're restrictive covenants yeah. contained. I think that's what. That's a good you suggestion. Too, was that I mean. So I just I'm just trying to create a realistic sense of what can actually happen now amongst those, even though that is your goal for the existing lots that yes. can be affected unless you impose that through the homeowners association as a right. value you wish to maintain. Right. In which case maybe you would want to do that for the too. I'm just thinking out loud a little. It can be dangerous, but yeah. All right. I, and and I don't I don't think I need to get into that issue very far because we're proposing with this lot to exceed that standard. But I, I take your point mm -hmm. of uh, maybe other lots within Murray Hill could build closer to the uh, side yard. Mm -hmm. That, or to, to all sides, front, back, and side, then. But um, it's my understanding of PUDs, and uh, you know, I'm not an attorney. I'm just somebody who uh, has heard things for a long time and repeating them, maybe unwittingly. But it's my understanding that in under Vermont law that when a PUD permit is granted and the setbacks are established, that those run with the land and that the change uh, by the municipality to create a new setback does not apply in a PUD. 
Now, we had two cases at Murray Hill uh, where that issue came up. And in one uh, version of the zoning ordinance, at one point, they were allowing 10 foot setback in the ordinance. And uh, Joan decided to challenge that when people wanted to build with a 10 foot setback. And she ultimately got the director of planning, I don't know his title exactly, uh, for the city to look at the issue. And he agreed with her that in a PUD, you cannot, the setbacks are not changed by a change in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. It can only be changed by the agreement of 100% of the owners because hmm. everyone relies on right. that at the time they buy into the property I, I, the same is true I, in other neighborhoods yeah i think yeah. we're getting a little far afield into the Sorry. the weeds but um i think the the board's point is that you know this may be just something to revisit but certainly you know if you want the more restrictive and if that's the request um we can certainly grant a subdivision uh, approve, or we can we can grant as part of the approval here to have these more restrictive setbacks um, as part of that. I, I don't see a, a legal problem with that, um, and I think the points that you're making are simply that it it is um, consistent with the other um, lots generally, um, and your understanding. And that obviously, if that comes down the line and somebody buys lot one. Um, and just because their neighbors are able to build a shed closer to the, the boundary line, if they should be able to do that, that's not really what we're looking at tonight. So let's look, uh, let's move forward. Um, so I, just so I understand, um, so there aren't any trees apart from a large sort of specimen oak. Um, and is that within the building envelope, uh, that oak? So that would be preserved even if there's construction right okay and um otherwise there's no trees it's open meadow right now um and the only the only real view of the meadow that's going to block is is a neighbor um on main street that might right now have an unobstructed view mr varney's raising his hand i'll, I'll let you obviously blocks me as well well i mean that's that's the question is you know if we're looking at the at the map you have a straight view right out of your driveway, Mr. If you want to come up, Mr. Varney, um, or if you're just responding. I'm just responding. Okay. I'm, I'm prepared to speak at some point, but okay. I just want to note that it would block my view. So noted. Uh, so let's. Any other questions about the view? Um, I didn't print one, but I can show you a picture on my pass around my phone of what it actually. I, I don't want to have your phone passed around because I'd have to. I'd hate to take it into evidence. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I bring my old phone. Here. Um, let's I, talk. If I could just add a comment to the, the view yes. shed question, that part of my reason for asking about if there was an original setback requirement from Upper Main Street when the PUD was created if that had any impact on building a house within what could be perceived as a view shed from Upper Main Street, because it appears that the land slopes up and away, and Mr. Varney's house is kind of set back a bit further, and this house obviously will be more in the view and potentially blocking aspects of that further meadow from a person traveling up upper main street and i wasn't sure if there were any prior conditions or criteria in which would have led to kind of any rationale behind why that swath of land was preserved originally and i asked the same question the first time we heard it yep. there wasn't a very clear point as to why that little piece in particular the, the very the purpose of naming it common land if if i recall testimony correctly um, was less was less than clear 
and was not explicit for that purpose. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question, though. So let's talk about utilities. Um, I understand you've gotten wastewater permits, um, and I'd like to take a little testimony on the uh, on the utilities that are going to be servicing this lot. Sure. So the uh, water supply will be a drilled well, and it's located on the site plan. Again, I'm using the um, blow up. Uh, map, but it's also on the survey, yeah, not survey, but the site plan prepared by uh, Grenier Engineering. Uh, but th this is a blow up of that Grenier drawing. So the, the well would be between the house and Murray Hill Drive. Um, the house would connect to the city sewer system. Uh, with a uh, six inch pipe uh, coming from the new house or wherever it's located uh, to an existing six inch pipe that's owned by the association. And that uh, pipe goes to a connection uh, at this location, which is a city manhole. Uh, so connect into the city sewer system at Main Street. Um, and we have the approval for a sewer allocation. Right. I, yeah. I saw one of, the, one of the documents in your packet was the uh, wastewater system and potable water supply permit. Right. That was dated, I think, July 11th, 2018 for this lot. Mm -hmm. So it's going to tie into the, the, the common water system for the Murray Hill Association and then into the city sewer. And it, it, well. it, it'll have its own drill. Oh, its well. own drilled well. Yeah. Okay. All right, and then the utilities are, as I understand, underground? They're all uh, at the site and they're all underground. All right. um. uh, just to point out that they, they were installed in 1983 in anticipation at that time that Joan and I were going to build a house on lot one, but they were not utilized because we didn't want to build on it. Is it fair to understand that, that part of the reason why you're asking for this boundary line adjustment is that you want to make this very particular type of building envelope a sort of very, um, for lack of a better word, suburban with a house in the middle surrounded by um, a fairly broad uh, setback? Um, it would be um, difficult to build um, a, how, uh, a house that uh, wanted a good solar orientation on the existing lot as a triangle, triangular lot and meet the setback requirements. So we're, the association is looking to uh, make this lot appealing and take advantage of its natural solar orientation uh, by, uh, in, by changing the shape of that lot so that uh, the owner would have more flexibility in orienting the structure. Okay. Uh, is Murray Hills, is that a p private drive or a public road? I apologize. Murray Hill Drive is a, a public city. 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 So does it have a curb cut or will that need to be obtained? It uh, would need to a curb cut approval from the city of Montpelier and a decision on whether a culvert will be needed for the driveway right. from the city. I'm skipping around on some of these, but if anyone has any questions, particularly on uh, the amendment to the PUD final plat review, some of the criteria, 
talks about choice of types in the environment or living units available in public and open space, recreation areas. I think we've gotten a fair amount of testimony. Uh, talks about pattern of development, which preserves trees, outstanding natural topographic features and geologic features, and prevents soil erosion. And then D, an efficient use of land resulting in smaller network of utilities and streets. Uh, and E, an environment in harmony with surrounding development. Um, are there design requirements for any of the buildings that are built in this neighborhood? Yes, there are the requirements in our declaration of bylaws that have to be met. Um, so um, it goes through our board of directors that ask, acts as the design review board now. So they have to approve the colors, they have to approve the style of the building, they have to approve the materials that are used on the building, they have to approve the landscaping. Thank you. Okay. Right. at this time, um, if there are any other neighbors that wish to speak or present, I think this would be a good time to, mm -hmm. to adjust. We have a, might have a few more questions, but um, we're sort of narrowing into the point. Mr. Varney, I think you had indicated you wish to speak. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind just coming up to a microphone and just stating your name uh, and address, that way we have a record of it. I'm Don Varney. I live at 70 Murray Hill Drive, which is lot two, next to lot one. I have a little handout I'd like to give you. If I could. don't have the benefit of surveyors or engineers, just me and Google and Paint Shop Pro, but All right. I ask you not to peek at the second page. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I use too. That's what I use too. Google and Google is your friend. So now remember, you're not looking at the second page. I'm tempted to look at the second page. Okay, so this this is an aerial from. Do you have a copy for the applicants oh, as well? Sure. Yes. Thanks. Just as a reference, now I'm going to let you look at the second page. I know you want to see it. This is a shot from Google Maps. And incidentally, it, it happens to be from the year 2012, when, just right after I bought the property. And I've kind of drawn in there the, some of the pertinent points. Um, and you can see how the property was landscaped when I bought it, what I thought I was buying. That's what I'm talking about that. But that red line that's crossing that gray car and intersecting with the yellow line and the point, that's the boundary point. It's in the middle of the driveway. The little yellow triangle is the uh, easement, so to speak. So it, when you look at it from top down, it doesn't seem very exciting. But when you look at it this way, you can probably see why I'm a little exercised about having lot one in the middle of my driveway. That's, this, is, this is the point. This is what I'm here for, is that lot being in the middle of the driveway. Now, I should tell you that. Over the years, I've been on the board of directors of Murray Hill, and probably about a year after I was there, I discovered I was going to put up a shed, and I wanted to know where the boundary was, and I had to go on a quest, and finally found kind of where the boundary was, and I was shocked to discover it was in the middle of the driveway. So I've been trying for a number of years to find a solution to this, buy the land, swap the land, and so far, nothing has ever happened. So I've kind of given up on that happening. But now going back to the first page, if you look at that, I, would, I could probably argue that I'm the one that originally proposed expanding lot one because I thought at the time that we talked about being able to do a, a swap of land and you could just do it, it as a quick administrative thing. So if we expanded this lot, I thought we could take a piece off of mine and give me a piece in the front and get rid of the easement on the driveway at the same time. And get rid of the swale out of the picture. So this white dotted thing is kind of what I proposed. Mostly I just, I don't know, it, I don't know a legal way to say it, but it seems to me to, to create a lot 
with an easement in it. And the blue line is the drainage swale, roughly. And have that right in the driveway. No matter what you say or do, that, that piece is going to be right there. Now, the thing that seems so absurd to me is that right now all the boundaries are fungible. You can move those boundaries anywhere you want. That's what we're here to do, move them around. And I'm not necessarily objecting to lot one. Yeah, I don't like the idea that it's going to spoil my view on that side, but that's not really, I mean, you live in, a, in the development, you can't really help that. But it seems to me that you could just slide that boundary over and make that lot in a nice clear land, not give the next guy that buys that lot an easement and a ditch. You could simply move that lot over a little bit to make a nice clean lot. And leave this little triangle as what? As some common land. We've got lots of common land. Let the drainage ditch run in there. Let the easement go there. Maybe me or the next guy will actually be able to do something about that boundary and get that property line out of the middle of their driveway. That's all I'd like you to consider is can't you just swing that whole lot over a little bit and take that headache away from everybody? Well, thank you very That's much. What I have to say. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Barney. I'm just as a note, you know, we're restricted as a board. We don't get to <clears throat> redesign these plans, and uh, it's certainly not a commentary. W either way, we vote on whether or not a proposal like that is reasonable. Um, it's it's just that we don't have the power to say we have a power to say yes or no. We can put conditions on an application, but we really don't have the power to say move this lot over. We can say this doesn't make sense the way it's drawn. Um, and I guess he... Does the board think it makes sense to have a property line in the middle of a driveway? I mean, you, this easement was granted because the original builder of the house could not build a driveway yet. They had to give them an easement so that they could do, do it. So this kind of thing does happen. Um, if we were talking about the expansion going into your driveway, we might have different questions. Part of it is that's the existing lot is where your driveway is. And some would make the argument that actually an easement's better because you don't pay property taxes on it. Oh, I thought of that. <laughs> but as you, as you see from the it's, second page, it's what was a nice landscaped area is how a field of weeds right against my driveway. And I would much prefer to be able to one thing to consider, and I don't mean this as anything other than just simply a uh, spitball take from from where I sit, um, but certainly if this lot is sold to somebody, it's not uncommon for neighbors to do boundary line adjustments. Uh, and what the representation of the homeowners association is is that that land this this area that you're focused on um, is not going to be developed so if down the road you wanted to take sort of full ownership of that and were able to work something out with a neighbor to adjust the boundary line um, that would seem to be would fall into something that you and a neighbor could work out as opposed to you and a homeowners association simply a, like I said, a spitball take from, from where I'm sitting, not actual legal advice. <laughs> well, I just heard that you can maybe put a, a shed 10 feet from the boundary line, so if well, this, the, neighbor, the new neighbor wants to put a shed right in that's, the side of my driveway. Right. One. No, because that would be in the front yard setback, and that's actually what the, um, the applicant, and this is unusual, I think this is why it took us aback, is that it's unusual for the applicant to say, please make us more restrictive, give us less than what we're entitled to. Um, and so that's what, what they're saying is, is that we want those as setbacks, meaning your neighbor down the line can't build anything except for that little square in the middle. So if they do want to put a shed, they're, they're restricted by the permit that we're issuing tonight. Um, so it's just, again, I, I think it's just something to consider. And like I said, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're kind of handcuffed here a little bit in that if we were in a different situation, it's certainly a re your arguments are grounded in reason, and <laughs> but not necessarily what we have the power to or authority to, to deal with. Was there another? Yes, Mr. Hahn? 
Yeah. You want to um, come on up to Mike, introduce yourself, state your address. Um, if, if I may, before before Charlie, Hone, it's Hone, right? Hone, yeah. Hone. That's Sorry. Everyone says Hone. So. That's all right. Um, before Charlie speaks, I just want to disclose that um, Charlie and I had a brief exchange about this um, application, though we made a point of not getting into the substance of it. Instead, I directed Charlie to speak with the zoning administrator, and um, I pointed him toward the parts of the zoning that I believed we would be walking through. So I just want to yeah. be fair about that and let everyone know that exchange took place. I didn't, if I was to do that, I apologize. Like, I'm That's on the right. conservation commission, and it's a little, a little different. Formal. No Not problem. that it's, you know, it's, it's a little different, so I didn't really. Oh, Charlie, it's no problem. I'm, d I'm just closing it for the benefit right. of everybody not to pick on you in any way. No, no. No. I've known Charlie well. Um, yeah. So, anyway, um, I'm Charlie Hong. I live at 282 Main Street. Um, that's lot negative one, except it's not on um, Murray Hill land. And as, as this map was passed out, it's right here. And I have a bunch of things to say, so I'll try not to blabber on too long about any single one of them. But I also wrote a, um, something to submit, so you can read. Sorry, I only have one, but um, hopefully that's helpful. Um, so um, first of all, I, in addition to being an abutting liner, I also work in the um, conservation field. For what it's worth, I work for the wetlands program. Um, and it's good that there's, I, you know, I don't have to worry about conflicts of interest because there's no wetland issues with this plot. However, I do, having done a lot of work with different conservation and land management related things, both here and in Vermont, I'm kind of, you know, I know I'm not a legal expert. I don't know what a Stowe Highlands test is. I've been at Mount Hunger. I don't know if that counts. But like, basically, um, my understanding of the PUD is that it was an agreement made when the um, neighbors all got together. I'm sure when they first built Murray Hill, people bickered and fought over everything because it's Vermont and you know a change was happening. Um, I wasn't here, so I didn't comment on that. But um, you know this this agreement was worked out with the community, and there's a tag on there that says common land, and it might not say it has to be forest or it has to say meadow, but this says common land. And you know I've been around a lot of developers in California who are pretty aggressive and to be honest there they pretty much always win despite what they might tell you but um, I've never had actually and I appreciate New England honesty but honestly like saying that we should undo a community agreement for any reason because the landowner wants to make money off of it and, and this is not picking on the Senate bill, but I know they're just representatives but um, and that don't even necessarily want to do this but like to have a conservation agreement or a um, planning agreement or whatever with the community is kind of a a, a, an, a a front almost to me to hear that like well you know all you have to do is say you want to make money by changing the rules and you know rules go out the window because I've certainly talked to you know my friends who live in the neighborhood and most people there thought the common land was actually part of an agreement I mean you know obviously the neighbors aren't all lawyers and they don't control that but I actually think it's a really concerning precedent because I know there's not that many PUDs here, but there's sounds like there's PUDs all over Vermont, and you know, if we come out and Montpelier comes out and says, all right, well a PUD um, is used to plan how our development works unless someone wants to make money, and then they can take their land and develop it, you know, and not have common land anymore. I mean, that's that that goes far beyond like my view getting ugly or something. This is like a, a big, it could be a big precedent. I don't, you know, I don't really know, um, but. It's something that really concerns me, especially as an abutter of this large four-acre parcel. And you know, the, the cynicals probably—I I take them at their word—they don't want to develop it. I, you know, I believe the HOA now doesn't want to develop it. But we know HOAs have representatives that come and go. You know, in five years, and, and we want to be there for the long run. And you know, I don't see any reason, based on my experience with HOAs elsewhere, not to believe that that whole field, by the time I, I'm old, will just—and you know, my daughter is grown up—will just be concrete. You know, I. And maybe at some point a line will be drawn, but the line isn't being drawn now. It won't be drawn the next house. It won't be drawn the next house. You know, so I mean, I think that's really concerning. And I, you know, especially that you're not just, it's not just an existing lot. You can argue whether or not lot one was really a thing. Maybe it was, but like, and, and you could even argue that it's triangle. That's a dumb shape. Make it a better shape. That's cool. But like to say that it has to be 0 0.6, 0 0.7 acres. I mean, like how many of you live on a lot bigger than that? I mean, to, to be fair, I do, but most of Montpelier is on smaller lots than that, and the idea that it has to be 0.6 acres that's taken out of the existing common line to be put into this is, you know, I don't, I don't really understand why that has to be the case. Um, 
So moving on, um, yeah, I, I read over the document that was written about this, and a couple. I just want to make a couple comments to that. First of all, the idea that there was no change in neighborhood character. It appeared that the they were talking about the Murray Hill neighborhood, and I agree, it probably won't have much change in the character of Murray Hill. But in terms of Main Street, it has a very big effect because this is not in the Murray. It's, it's in Murray Hill land, but it's extending way out into next to Main Street and. Most of the, you've probably all been up there, most of the Main Street houses are not the quote unquote suburban feel. They're like more, I don't know, you can call it traditional Vermont. Small little houses along the road with maybe big areas of land behind them, a stream, tiny lawns. You know, our house is a little different, but it's kind of the same. We've been shrinking our lawn. We've got, you know, one house. Um, it's, you know, I, I don't think you can actually say that it's not going to change the character of the neighborhood to build a house, a Murray Hill style house on Main Street. This is not to slander Murray Hill, you know, to each their own, but like, it is very different from what the neighborhood is down here. And I think that it would make a lot more sense to have that house put within the core of the Murray Hill community instead of dangling down. And I think, you know, I invite, I, and, and yeah, in full disclosure, I will make our view a lot, a lot uglier because our house faces in that direction. Our giant picture window is in that direction. The whole house was built around that field. And so, yeah, it'll it'll make me really sad. I understand that's not really a concern of, you know, anyone else other than me and my kid, you know. Well, she doesn't care. She'll probably be like, ooh, bulldozers, you know, cool. But, um, you know, and so I'll disclose that. Yeah, I do care about that. But that's not even, like, the main thing I'm, you know, talking about here. It's, it will have a big effect on the neighborhood. And especially, I don't think there's anything that can convince me if you approve this, that other stuff would not get approved over the next 10 to 20 years. Because, you know, as he said, you, maybe you should, maybe the law is now, let's build a thousand houses. Maybe he doesn't want to build a thousand houses, but who knows, you know, maybe in 10 years, the new HOA will want to build a thousand houses. And then I'm like in, you know, whatever, South Burlington or something. That's not really what we were expecting. Um, about the hydric soils and the um, runoff, it's not a wetland. Um, but it still has hydric soils. Um, water isn't necessarily going to absorb very well in those hydric soils. Typically, if someone is doing, you know, worried about storm water, and this is an impaired brook in the watershed, I realize the house is set a little ways away from the brook, which is good. Um, you, you can poke around in our field, and I've done a lot of that because I'm a wetland ecologist. In some places, you dig a hole, water just disappears. Other places, um, it won't. You know, after an inch of rain, there's just water flowing down our hill because it's not very deep to the water table or the bedrock. And so, you know, I would hope that someone has done like some percolation tests, at least digging a hole, seeing if the water soaks in, before you assume that that storm water won't impact the brook. Because if you don't know otherwise, I'd assume it probably will because there's just not a lot of infiltration there. But you know, it's underground. It's really hard to say. Same with the well. I know one of the reasons that this lot wasn't pushed farther up Murray Hill is because the um, well issues. Well, Murray Hill's well has this big, fat well protection area, which is awesome. You know, water protection is great. Then you look at our well, it's got nothing. And I realize this is a few hundred feet away from our well, but uh, disclosure, I'm not, you know, a geologist, but um, bedrock in this part of Vermont runs from north to south. And since north is higher uphill, we're, you know, our well is not just drawing from our field. Our well is drawing from the north. And that you can see that in the Murray Hill well area, which goes way north. And, you know, I, I kind of would hope someone could tell me why my family's water was less important to protect than Murray Hill's water. And if that's not the case, I would hope someone has at least done the research to determine that this wouldn't harm our well, both in terms of them taking out water too, or in terms of whatever fertilizer or pesticides or whatever they apply on their lawn, you know, I think I think it's important. And I think there's other people on Upper Main Street who are closer to it than me. So I, you know, I hope, and I looked at the NR Resource Atlas and I saw several wells within, you know, a couple hundred feet of that well. And I don't know, I mean, maybe that's all been considered, but I think it's something that needs to be documented and everything. Um, in terms of special natural features or whatever, it's, you know, like I said last time in my brief comment, it's not Victory Basin or Yellowstone, it's a field, but I've documented over 360 species using our field, and you actually, you know, looking at the overall shape of the fields, you couldn't choose a worse place to put a house in terms of affecting the habitat. It actually, because if you if you go and look, the, technically the common line goes farther south, but there's a big fat mowed lawn with the Murray Hill sign around it, which, you know, again, that's fine, but you will, you will, stagger across from that you will literally just cut that field off and then there's another landowner who has a big block of forest around the back all the way back to the cemetery there, that's no longer accessible to any of the animals as easily as it was before and i'm not going to lie you know the deer are still going to get in and eat my vegetables i, I, I if we we're just the deer i'd be happy to have them like not come to our land but you know we're gonna uh, we've spent um the whole four or five years we lived there restoring our um 
you know, trying to build a, a pollinator ecosystem and a native plant ecosystem, and you know, it is, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect that. I have no doubt of that, you know, as an ecologist. Um, and then, yeah, I just, I just, I think this is all stuff you consider. Um, I don't think that we should be removing conditions from our agreements that has been made with the community. I realize a lot of people have just moved away or died, but you know, I hope when I die that the agreements we make in our community, the community we build, it remains longer than myself. So that my daughter and, and her kids, if she has kids, can come and say, well, you know, like this is something my dad helped build. And you know, I think it's kind of sad that the community, maybe it's too sappy, but the community got together and made this agreement and then, you know, we're just gonna float it away and you know, there's nothing against the anyone else. It's just it doesn't I don't it's not the way I think other people would it just doesn't it doesn't seem right and it doesn't make me feel good about living in this community if our agreements aren't being held, you know, and maybe maybe the law supersedes, maybe money supersedes our agreements, you know, maybe that's the world we live in, but um, not really what I was hoping to hear and you know, I really would hope you consider moving the lot somewhere else that is a little, you'd still lose common land, but trying to make it a little more centralized. This is not walkable, this is not infill, this is kind of sprawl out into some of the open space. There definitely would be worth considering other places to build it if you can find something. I definitely think it's a mistake to build this big giant lot. And honestly, I think, you know, if we want to talk about compromise, you know, maybe don't push the house back away from the road towards the field in our house. At least say, well, if you're going to build it, keep the lot a little smaller, push it up against the road so that the impact is more centralized towards the people who benefit from it, which is the HOA who are selling it, you know, because it seems fair to me, you know. And yeah, you know, I'd like to see, and I know, you know, I can't specifically speak for other landowners, but all, all the people I've talked to, you know, all, all feel that that field is, is something that's been conserved, and if that's not conserved, I think we're owed, you know, some communication. I know they said they went out and talked to the landowners, and again, I'm not, not picking on you two at all, but like, the only commu communication I got is we are building this house, we are building it this way, just deal with it. There's been no attempt to be like, hey, can we try to adjust this somehow? Can we consider other sites? Can we talk about it? It's just, this is what we're doing, and like it or leave it, you know, and so, you know, I mean, maybe that's not the business of the Planning Commission, but I'm, you know, I'm open to talk to my neighbors, but I'm just, yeah, I'm hoping that we can get some clarity and that it's not going to be the next Walmart, because right now I'm feeling like, you know, I can hear the McDonald's bells ringing or the Taco Bell bells. I don't think there's any commercial development proposed in this application. Not in this one, but if you decide that PUD can be denied I, because someone wants to make money, then I, I don't. Denied. I don't think we can look at those future applications based on this. You can't look at um, precedent. Well, no. I mean, it, it's it's not related. I mean, I think one of the problems in in the argument that you're making is that there's distinctions to be made between applications. And so I, I was just simply noting that, you know, it, this is a one unit boundary line adjustment and clarification on the common area designation. Um, I don't think it makes sense to say that the sky is falling. Um, can, can we talk about the sky not falling, or do we just have to have the same meeting every five years until I am 80? Until you what? It, it, it feels like a, pre a precedent is being set. We're deciding that every time that HOA wants to make some money, they can sell off potentially part of their comp time. Can I comment? Yes. Um, just a second. Uh, Mr. Hone, do you have any other comments? No. Okay. Um, Sure, Mr. Bigglestone, if you wouldn't mind yeah. going up to a microphone. So, obviously, Charlie has. Yeah, oh, sorry, if you introduce yourself. Uh, Eric Bigglestone, I'm a resident of Murray Hill as well as president of Homeowners Association. Um, obviously, Charlie has his feelings. He's throwing lots of accusations out there that don't seem to have substance. He's even said so. He's not a geologist, whatever it may be. I want to make it clear that this is not a money grab. We didn't suddenly say, hey, let's make a new lot so we can make money. This is a lot that has been approved. How many ever years ago it exists? We are just looking at the best interest of Murray Hill. Um, if we have the ability to develop one more lot, we should have the right to look at that. Um, we're not carving out new land. We're not going to add 10 more lots down the road. Even if I'm not sitting on the board or anybody here is not sitting on the board, it's impossible for us to create more lots at Murray Hill. Number one, our water capacity can't handle it. 
uh, we're not allowed, well, I could handle it, but we're not allowed to build any more based on the water capacity that we have now. That's why we have to drill a new well. And there's, there's, there's no other place to place this lot. It is a, a lot that was approved, again, I'm going to reiterate myself, when this development first came about. So I just want to make that clear that this is not, we suddenly need money, let's sell a lot, let's get as much money as possible for it without any consideration. We, we might not even put it up for sale. We just, we, we feel that the best interest of Murray Hill at this time is to explore the option. We have the Senecals, we have their knowledge, so we have asked them to apply on our behalf. I'd just like to make that clear. Thank you. Um, can you give me this? Can I give this? Give it to uh, Meredith. She can. Um, and I just note that, you know, as, as with, as I said before, it's not really the job of the DRB um, to redesign applications. We, we have to take them as they are. And um, so to the extent that there's an idea that there might be a better place for this, that's not really before us. Um, the question is, is this fit within the regulations and laws that govern our zoning board? Can we approve this or not? Or can we approve it with some conditions and it will suffice? And so, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's often, beguiling to think, well, what could be? What could be better? And that's a great conversation to often have um, between neighbors, between different groups. Uh, it's just not anything that we as a DRB can necessarily entertain. Uh, so it's, you know, we, we have, we're limited to this. Just as if you were coming before us with an application, um, any of you, and I don't mean any one person, you would have hopefully put some thought into it and to have us sort of sit here and speculate, well, what if you did this? Um, it would be a very frustrating process. It would also, I think, go contrary to what our job is, which is a bit more like an umpire in a baseball game to call the balls and strikes. Um, so, you know, I, I just want to keep us focused on what that necessarily is. Kate, did you have a point? Um, thank you, Dan. If I may just add to that, um, I just I want to acknowledge I, I heard concern about the um, impacts of incremental development bit by bit um, in, in general in Vermont. I didn't hear that as an accusation, but as an issue in general, I, I, I totally hear you. And that is a question we've faced on the DRB is if one lot is done in this spot and another is done, on, how do we anticipate the others that are done? But uh, as Dan said, we are, we're bound by, with, by what the law allows us to glance at and, and evaluate at any one time. Though certainly those questions of, well, what's next? Next and how does that? How do those puzzle pieces fit together? Are valid questions. Um, they are, aren't questions we can answer with the pieces of paper in front of us. But I just do want to acknowledge your concern about incremental development. So do yeah. the PUD have any? So who would I talk to if I had concerns about the PUD not being followed? Well, I mean, what do you mean by not being followed? I mean, so the yeah. decision that we're going to make is whether or not to allow an amendment of the boundary line for lot one. We've already determined the lot one exists as a separate lot, and we already determined at a prior meeting that the language reserved for common land on lot one was not a critical condition to the issuance of the subdivision permit, such that lot one could not be developed. So now the question is, we are going to answer the question of whether or not a boundary line adjustment uh, is allowed. That will then be part of the PUD. Well, first of all, I wasn't allowed to give a comment during the first meeting, even though I sat here for two hours. I, I said something, but I wasn't allowed to give an official comment on whether or not. So, I, you know, I'm trying to address that now because I wasn't. Sure, if you have anything more to add, please add it. Um, Charlie, can you go up to the microphone? I, I came to the other meeting and, and that whole thing was passed through and as a landowner or as a citizen or as a person concerned about conservation, I wasn't given the chance to comment. I'm commenting now because I want to at least be heard, you know, even if I'm ignored. Um, well, you're not this is meant as a personal accusation mm -hmm. against Murray Hill. Murray Hill is probably, you know, the best HOA I've encountered of all the stuff in California and stuff. The, the, just the fact is that, you know, if, if one HOA doesn't have to follow the PUD that they set out, then, you know, it is just... It does matter, and 
you know, if not you, then who do I turn to if I feel like a community agreement that has been set in a legal um, document or whatever it is isn't being followed? Well, what, one, one thing that I think it's important to keep in mind is that we're not saying that the PUD conditions don't have weight. It's just that there are different conditions in different ways. For example, if, if a person applies for a restaurant and says, I want as a condition that I can be open for lunch. So we say, OK, they can be open for lunch. And they want to come back and they want to change that. And they say, I want to do lunch and dinner. Now, if there is a reason for having that lunch condition in there, there may be a good reason to deny that dinner. But if it was just simply in there to clarify when they were open in the first place, then adding dinner is not causing any harm. And that's what we did at the first meeting, was really a determination of, was this essential common land that when they approved this in 1983, this was an essential part of this PUD, an essential part of the contract. And the determination that we made at the end, after the comments were taken, was that it was not. And that's what the Stoke Club Highlands test is about, is, is to say that there are certain essential conditions that are, are the basis for granting approval by a, an Act 250 commission, by a development review board, um, that are essential. That if to change them, you have to meet a high threshold. And the determination last time was that wasn't that wasn't what was going on here. What was going on here was a little bit more of they offered it as the applicants themselves imposed it. Um, really not intended to create reliance in the town or in the community, but just simply to clarify that for the time being, this was a, a common use lot because they didn't intend to develop it. And so the, it's, it's hard, and, and, and that's why I, I want to take your, I, I take your comments seriously, and that's why I'm trying to respond is to say, this isn't, I don't see this at least and the board voted last time that it didn't see this as an essential condition. Now, other conditions on here as part of the PUD that was granted back in 1983 can't be revisited. And that's why we took seriously the uh, analysis about density, because there was a density calculation that was done, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't, um, that we weren't allowing creeping development, that just because the, the infill that was created since then has changed, that we weren't somehow shortchanging the intent of this, this community. And, you know, part of this is that this is a suburban-like community. It has a certain quality to its, its lots um, in the way in which the driveway flow that, as you point out, is different from your neighborhood on Main Street. Um, so, you know, part of that is is what it is, and we're trying to balance um, these various factors. And as I understand, the Homeowners Association wants this existing lot to be developed, to, to add. And the question that's before us is, is there anything in the PUD that requires this condition? Um, and it's a two-step process. The last step that we took was, was it an essential condition? And we ruled uh, as a board, no. It was not an essential condition requiring a elevated. But part of what we've been taking evidence on tonight um, is whether or not um, even if we did lift this condition, would it create a negative impact? And I think your testimony has gone to that, that uh, certainly for your house, there is a negative impact. You've also talked now about the wildlife. I actually had a follow-up question on the wildlife. You said you said the deer probably won't be affected because they don't seem to be affected by much of anything. No. Um, but what kind of wildlife are we talking about that you're, you're um, purporting may be affected by this development. Well, I'm, I'm a botanist, and so, you know, you can actually go on, I, I will get into these literal weeds, but you can go on iNaturalist, and you can see a list of all the species I've documented. If you're interested, ask me later, I'll, I'll or send me an email. But, um, well, I, I mean, we can't take evidence outside of the hearing, okay. so that's why I'm, I'm asking now. There's, you know, everything from, like, species of moths to plants that have come in on their own through the, you know, because they had dis are dispersed by birds or by other animals to, um, you know, we had a rare orchid pop up at one point in our tiny little wetland, which is another one, like, if another well is drilled, will the wetland dry up? I don't know. You know, um, there is, and it is not federally, it's not, it doesn't have special status. It's just cool and uncommon. Um, right. There's, you know, probably, there's like five species of goldenrod or something like that. There's, you know, there's a lot of stuff. None of it is like an endangered species, but, you know, I, I, I value it. I think other residents in Montpelier value it. 
Well, and, you know, I mean, I think a lot of these points are, are certainly something that the Homeowners Association should be considering for the remaining common land because, you know, as they testified before, they have a big well area that they have to protect and those type of species. Does my well get any protection off our land? Well, that's, that's a good question, and that's, um, you know, that's an ongoing issue, which is um, the, the well is, we don't, we don't rule on well protection areas as a zoning matter. We're charged with looking at, you know, making sure that a property isn't created that doesn't have access to water. But the well shields um, are something that goes through the agency of natural resources. Um, and in a case like this, you know, the answer is probably no. Um, that there's, the well protection is, you know, uh, there's a number of different issues, and I, I can tell you that the Murray Hill people have had issues with their well protection area, their secondary well protection area with the Vermont Compost Company oh, yeah, I, up, I uphill. Um, that, I... Nor will I. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, these are, these are the constants kind of push and pull, because if you have a well shield area that goes beyond your boundaries, um, you know, there may be issues about protection of that well. Uh, when your neighbors seek to develop, but if your neighbors have a right to develop, you know, we're not here to, we're not well experts, and we're not well shield experts. So development rights supersede clean water? We just, it's not something that we it's can consider. It's not something we can It's not do. something this board can consider. Okay. It's, it's not with it's the not, Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and it's not this board, so it doesn't. And lastly, in terms of the, the PUD, is there, and is there something that other than the preferences of the HOA that would protect the land, that land from being further developed by any sort. So what I would probably recommend is if you're really serious about this, um, you can certainly have a conversation with Meredith and review the, um, the PUD permit that was granted in 1983 and go through the various details because there are certain things that are in there that do protect it. Um, but you, you know, ultimately you may want to seek legal counsel as an abutting neighbor to figure out what, what exactly the status of such things as the common area that abuts your backyard um, is entitled to, um, either through the various declarations uh, of the of the ho the homeowners association, um, through the subdivision and PUD permits that were granted back in 1983, um, or any other types of uh, environmental permit. And it's not something we can necessarily answer um, with any definitive nature here, because you know we haven't been asked to look at the larger. Um, common area, what they've testified to is that these common areas were labeled as such. These, these other common areas outside of Lot 1 were labeled as such and that they find them important, particularly the 12-acre one because of the well, um, you know, and they're in common ownership. Um, so it does, you know, it does raise those issues, but I can't give you a definitive answer tonight. So this isn't the group that keeps the HOA following the PUD. We don't enforce. No, no we, we, we are the group that keep, well, the zoning administrator is the one who does enforcement. If, if, they're, if they're violating their permit, the zoning administrator does the first notice of violation, and then it might come before us if there's a notice of violation that we have to enforce. But, but there is no actual mechanism that protects my well or, you know, the land, that land, that keeps that land is. Let, let me see if I... I want to check with Meredith. I, I think that usually the way that that would be implemented is if the zoning bylaw had a standard in it that said something like, shall not, uh, the development or subdivision shall not have an undue adverse impact on the access to water for surrounding properties. And I don't think we have a drinking water access to a drinking right. water right. provision or standard in our zoning. And so it would be the DEC permit, that either the well drilling or that that would probably look into that. I'm, yeah. I'm afraid we don't have we don't have even a standard against which to evaluate that question, though it's not a it's a reasonable question. Okay. And Thanks. Uh, was there any further testimony you wish to add? <clears throat> I do want uh, very briefly to uh, speak about the. Uh, the issue of the uh, impact on neighborhood water supplies. 
Um, Murray Hill has uh, a total of four drilled wells that it utilizes. All I need to do is find Plan for everything else that goes So this is the large meadow. There are four drilled wells in here. Um, we only draw water out of two of those wells. We check the static water levels in all four wells um, twice a year at a, at a minimum. We have a hydrogeologist that uh, if we then feed that information to our hydrogeologist, and uh, he then uh, does a report. His last one was in uh, 2016. And the wells are arranged so that between the well that we're talking about drilling down here and the wells up here, we have one of the wells that isn't, we don't pump water from. So the data that we give him on static water level changes in that well, which we call well number one, enables him to assess whether we're having any drawdown impact, or, and if we are, what the extent of that drawdown impact is on the general aquifer, not immediately adjacent to our well, but some distance away, such as where well number one is located. His report in 2016 um, stated that uh, there was, uh, you could discern drawdown in immediate proximity to the wells that are being pumped, but that they recover when the pumps go off. Uh, that well one, which would be kind of the barometer on whether we're a water supply a significant distance from where we're pumping would be affected, is that there is no uh, evidence at all of any change in the groundwater aquifer by the time you get from where we pump to where well number one is located. And I say that for the point that uh, we're talking about a well that would be utilizing somewhere between three and 400 gallons a day on peak days during the year. Uh, that we've drawn, we're, we're talking about wells at Murray Hill that are drawing uh, 10,500 gallons a day on average and around 14,000 gallons a day on peak days, and yet we're having no effect on a well just south uh, of that location. So uh, it, it's, not, uh, it's not a simple statement of saying, well, my well is, well, my well. <laughs> that a well is going to be affected because someone is going to build a house and drill a well at it uh, when the evidence in the immediate neighborhood oh. is that Good catch. Wow. Paul needed the exercise. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I hope you're not paying him by the hour to catch these things. <laughs> It's not very stable. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to make that point. Okay. And uh, as far as the um, the protection of the the homeowners association uh, or the compliance with the PUD standards, so the, the rules of the road uh, were established in 1983. The association adopted a um, Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions, and a set of bylaws. And based on uh, legal advice, it was structured so that to make a change in the PUD, it takes 67% of all of the owners at Murray Hill 
voting in agreement with the change before uh, it could be before we could even seek permits. So we went through that process this time, and we had uh, 60 votes cast, 61 votes cast, and one voted no. Uh, the other 60 voted yes, they wanted to make this change in Lot 1. If there were to be a proposal to add an additional lot, we're, we're talking about using an existing lot but changing its shape. If there were to be a proposal to add an existing lot, I cannot imagine people at Murray Hill um, ever agreeing that they would uh, request it. But the new, the uh, common interest ownership statute that was enacted a few years back by the Vermont legislature uh, now has a uh, standard that uh, to, ex to add an additional lot to an existing PUD, it takes 100 percent of the owners agreeing to it. Um, I have spoken to the board of directors about this. I am a big fan of that. But Murray Hill is under the statute that allowed 67 percent to be the determining thing. So I'm lobbying my board of directors at Murray Hill again. Uh, but this is a great idea uh, to the board has the authority to amend its governing documents to uh, make it, make Murray Hills PUD subject to the new common ownership statute, which would mean it would take 100% of the people to change the PUD. And I'm a big fan of that. Okay. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, any further questions from the board? I mean, I'll, I'll simply note that common land going forward, there was a reason why this was granted with common land, such excessive common land. And, you know, I'll just simply say that we're, we're not being asked to judge the greater common land. We're, we're very much focused on this specific application. So, you know, that doesn't carry, at least in my view, any precedential value as far as what happens in the future. But um, unless anybody has any further, uh, yes. Rob. I just have one quick question. Um, the status of the Mike Patterson survey plot, we weren't given a f complete copy of that in the in the application. Um, so I just didn't know if you had a, co a complete copy with you that we could you know, look, look at or just that. glance at real quickly. We have. Let me see. And I may have copies of everything except the full survey. It's, which is fun. I just would ask that it be. Um, it I know Meredith has one. We, we survey of the entire. No, just no. a survey of a just lot. Mike. Right. But well, he's asking for because it says it's an excerpt. He was wondering if there, if Mike Patterson did a survey of the entire. Oh no! PUD. Oh no! I'm just asking for. Uh, he did a survey here to create a new lot line. Right. You know, yep. for the adjustment. And there's a, you know, there's a whole sheet with the notes and. Right. In addition to not another Absolutely. sheet, but the same sheet. I just we just don't um, have it. And I'd so, be glad to. That's fine. To give that to, to Meredith yep. uh, yeah. for files. Yeah. Well, I think I, I believe we transmitted it to her, but maybe not. I th well, not only that, but I think you'll we'll have to have um, a mylar. Yeah, we'll have to have well the mylar with, uh, the, with the boundary line adjustment. Right. So that would be that the, the site plan mylar. Of okay. This, not necessarily. You know, it, it depends on you know different aspects of this. Right, mm -hmm. so it could be a mylar of this. One, once you can the say lot, what you want. When the lot is approved, then Mike Patterson finishes his work, and then we do a mylar, and then it gets recorded. Yeah, was there, records. I guess my question is, is it, are, we, are we doing final plot review on this or just site plan? No, we're doing, I mean, we're doing a final plan. Final plot yeah. review. Yeah. Um, we call it now. So yeah. I think there's... If there's if there's something specific that you want to see, um, I mean, we don't always have a requirement that the full survey. 
be shown. Um, obviously, if there's a specific issue that would you're looking for. <laughs> uh, no, no, I just, you know, I, I, I guess in my, <laughs> in my profession, I'm always required to, uh, to, to do so, I, but I have not done any work in Montpelier. Um, but I think a survey includes the, you know, the title block, the notes, mm -hmm. the, you know, the stamp. Um, and um, I, I don't know, I, I would be comfortable with, uh, if we're doing an adjustment uh, and there's a final mm -hmm. plat that it be submitted with the entire what? application, maybe not now, but. I see, um, so making sure it has the legend on it, yeah, the, the surveyor stamp and all that. Right, so the, the final plat has to have all of those yeah. things on it, but we don't necessarily see an exact copy of that during this part during of the, the application, application process. Okay, in so in part because oftentimes that's generated as a result of what we were put on as far as conditions are concerned. So we're not approving final plot tonight? Well, we're, we're <laughs> we may be talking about two different things. We're not approving the final map plat, but we're approving the, any condition, we're approving the zoning, uh, the zoning application, which is entitled on my notes. Um, of course, I can't find them. But we're we're approving, which is called final plat. Um, oh, final plan. Final plan. Sorry. Final it's plan. It's final plan. Once once this aspect is dealt with, and you've assumed the final, you know, approved a final plan, then they will submit a final plat to our office. Okay. I'll then look at that and see if it's met all the conditions that everybody has agreed upon. And it, I don't do the final approval. Actually, Dan has to literally sign that plat and look at it as well. Um, and if there's issues where it doesn't comport, there's something, you know, a legend missing, something like that, it doesn't get approved. But this board doesn't approve the actual plat, just the chair signs at the end. Yeah. We are approving the new lot, and then as long as the new lot is depicted on the plat, uh, just the board chair signs it. So as far as this board's role, this is all we will do. So if there's information that you think is important that's not on what we have, uh, then we need to make sure that it's noted so that it is included on the final plat. I, I think it's always reasonable to ask applicants to submit documents with titles and dates and yeah. legends and things like that. So if you're if you're requesting in part that to to ensure that we don't just get a zoomed in part of a survey, but instead see the context, I I, th I would agree with that. Yeah. I okay. That's that was my that was my only request. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Okay. All right. So, Kevin, Mr. Chair, would you uh, uh, want the board to entertain a? Uh, a motion to close the public hearing and to enter deliberative session. I, 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 I would I would enjoy such a motion if that's what you have just made. It's motion uh, by Kevin, uh, second by Kate. No, no, you have a. Uh, I have well, some additional have a, questions. Let's. Uh, okay, you for the applicant. Yes, okay. um, for something that we went through pretty quickly, but I want to make sure that I fully understand it in light of additional evidence that's been given, um, and that has to do with the swale. Um, good description at the beginning. Thank you for the dimensions. Um, we've since learned from, from Mr. Hone that, there, that they are hydric soils, so it relates to some questions I jotted down when you were first talking. I'll try and keep it brief. Um, you said that the swale, because of its dimensions, spreads out the water instead of creating an erosive channel. Um, and so you suggested, that suggested to me that the water flows away from the site. But I also wondered if because it's hydric soils and because it is pretty broad, doesn't the water infiltrate? And is there a risk of being pretty soggy soils around where the house is going to be built? Uh, no, the the swale actually intercepts any water that is flowing towards the building site. Well, so, I understand that, but does it not absorb the water and kind of put it into the ground all around? Um, well, it's been there for 34 years, and except after a rainstorm, you can walk on it pretty uh, readily and... Um, I don't know, Don Varney would know more than I do about it. He lives next to it. Um, but I've, this year, uh, we've had a lot of hot weather, but this year I've been, uh, I've walked it several times. Mm -hmm. It has never sh has shown any indication of moisture at all. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, uh, I guess that suggests to me that the water is absorbed into the ground, and I just, as we're approving, our job is to make sure we approve a buildable site. I want to make sure that 
the, the water interacting with that site does not render it unbuildable. And right. there wasn't a chance to introduce this earlier. I don't mean to be, I'm not intending to sh throw any sort of curveball. I just want to understand what's, how the water's behaving on the site. Right. Um, the, the swale is intercepting water. The land below it, where uh, I believe Don was, uh, excuse me, Mr. Hone was referring to hydric soils. Uh, but we had the wetlands biologist out there. She did several auger testings <laughs> yeah. and said, uh, this is really great soil. Are you sure you don't want to build an on-site sewer system? <laughs> um, so I'm so not sure how. <clears throat> I believe uh, Mr. Hone works in the same division that uh, Shannon Morrison, who did the uh, site inspection uh, work, so maybe they can have a conversation between her saying that the soils are good enough to put in an on-site sewer system and his indication that the soils are uh, might be uh, moist or have a moisture problem. Mr. Varney, if you have a... I could elaborate on If you me. wouldn't mind going to Mike, sorry. <laughs> For the folks playing along at home. I could elaborate on that swale fire and the fact it is dry most of the time. When we have heavy rain, it comes down, goes under the road, runs the swale. At times I've stood up to my ankles in the water rolling, rolling through, but when it crossed into my land, cover, first building my land, put a culvert pipe in. So it's collected in that pipe, goes under my land, then comes out of the back of my land, and goes into the meadow way down there. So in that respect, there would be no impact on that house because all that water does flow down and goes out into the field far below. Okay. It might be what would concern him. Mm -hmm. It's way down the back of the field. Okay. okay. Um, Any other questions? That, that helps me wrap my head around the, the water issues, not having been to the site. It's just the sort of thing that was a little bit of a yellow flag and wanted to make sure it was not going to cause problems in the future. Shahan, you had a comment? I, I just wanted to say for the record that I'm in no way questioning anything that Shannon found at the site. She has my full confidence. All I was trying to say was that on our land, I've observed, which is on the same map soil complex, I've observed that a lot of times the water doesn't readily soak in. Um, I haven't poked around a lot once. Business. Okay. I don't, I don't okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we Thank have you. a motion by Kevin. Uh, do we have a second? Second. Second by Kate. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to close the evidence and to take the matter under deliberation in a deliberative session, please raise your right hand. You have passed. Thank you all very much uh, for your time, for your comments, uh, for your very thorough analysis from all sides of this. Um, we will issue a written decision uh, following uh, a deliberative session in a few days. It usually takes our process uh, to vet that uh, around at least a week or two. Um, our other business, our next regularly scheduled meeting is Tuesday, September 4th, 2018, 7 p.m. Same time, same channel here in the city council chambers. Thank you all very much. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn into a deliberative session? I just have one, oh, one question yes. before, before we go on to our other business. Um, the last meeting, uh, we entered deliberative session for 27th School Street, if I recall. Yes. And the decision was going to be drafted? It, what, it was, I just, I'm looking for a status of that. It was circulated. Did it Did you not, not get a copy? arrive? I, we've been having issues with our email. I, you know, now that you mentioned that, I probably should have checked spam mail or something like that, but no, I never saw it. Okay, so, yeah, check it to you your seen either. folder. Okay. I, see Kate I, didn't, I, didn't see, I didn't see it either. Oh, okay, so this I'm going to have to talk to Tech. Issue. Yeah, because I, we had some bounced back, and I got message on messages on that, okay. but then others' emails didn't bounce back, so... Well, I'm, right, I'm glad I raised yep. the issue. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to talk to Seth. Thanks. 
Yeah, we did that last week. Yeah, so. okay. If it's yeah, I received it under an email that said, like, test, and then had okay, a copy of it. And then I should have no. sent a new, you and, because you and Dan were the only ones it bounced back from, oh. that I got messages on, so I resent it to both of you, but I didn't get messages from anybody else. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Wow. Because I will, I, will, I will tell you, just as a, just as a matter of habit, I, I will res always respond, mm -hmm. even if just to say, looks great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Big meeting with Seth tomorrow morning. Okay. So let's adjourn. Uh, yeah, let's have a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion that we adjourn into a deliberative session. Okay, a motion by Ryan. Second. Second by Tom. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much.